What's going on guys, this is Rob, and man, let me tell you guys something. Okay, Inferno is here, and here's the thing, we need to get caught up, man. All right, so here's what, so this week, we're just gonna dump X-Men content. I know I've said that before, we're actually going to, right? We're just, we're gonna dump a ton of X-Men stuff. So that's, that's something to look forward to. Everybody on Patreon, I apologize. We're gonna postpone Patreon stuff, because honestly, we just don't have enough time for it all. Uh, we're just, we're gonna, we're gonna get caught up on the X-Men, right? We need to get caught up on all this stuff, because, oh, Inferno is amazing. Okay, so I'm, I'm very, very excited for this after this is done i think what we might do when we have like all the stuff completed is we're going to do a full story from the beginning of house and powers of x all the way up to the end of inferno right this is the end of the three-part act right this is this is where hickman's done he moves on he goes to three moons three worlds whatever it is right and just kind of calls it a day i'm curious to see how long this full story would be i feel like it'd be like like over 24 hours <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if that'd be the case or not. But what this does is this initially opens up with the Orcus Forge, right? Now remember, the Orcus Forge, because it's been a while since we talked about this, the Orcus Forge is the headquarters of essentially Orcus itself. And Orcus is a coming together of a multifaceted group of people, right? Like advanced idea mechanics, Hydra, just the government in general, right? Like just normal human scientists, all these people working together for the purpose of what is in effect destroying the human threat. And what this does is it focuses on what is basically the X-Force team. Wolverine, Domino, uh, Kid Omega, right? Quentin Quire. These guys are highly capable. And as they get in there, they're immediately met by the arrival of, of Nimrod, right? Now, this is one of the most important things about the character of Nimrod. We talked about it before, but it bears refreshing here, right? Nimrod has the ability to analyze a mutant, to know what their powers are, and then develop basically counters to their powers. So in the case of Domino, Domino has the ability to bend probability to her favor in a localized field. So so what does Nimrod do? He says, solution, cluster bombs with quantum targeting, which number in excess of the combat area, basically overwhelm her powers to the point that there's no conceivable means for her to escape. And ultimately it works. One of these bombs bonds itself to, to Domino and she gets blown to pieces. Following that, it goes to, to Quentin Choir, right? Kid Omega, Nimrod analyzes him. Mutant possesses Omega level telepathy as well as some telekinetic ability. Threat level, enhanced, processing cores at risk. Solution, rotate psionic shields and phase shift cores into secondary host, then disintegrate target before he can overcome defenses, i.e. Quentin Quire can dominate the minds of both man and machine. So basically create more minds than he can dominate at any one particular point in time and move so fast that he can't react. And that's exactly what happens, right? Like literally Nimrod starts phasing through his mind basically to the point that Quentin Quire can't dominate it. And then while that happens, create a second version of himself to attack Quentin Quire from behind. And then he says, that that just leaves and then yes, right? Wolverine, the last man left, right? Busting hit, busting out his adamantium claws, tearing a hole through uh, through Nimrod, and then he's just easily incinerated by those robots. And then it's just stop, freeze it there. And that's when you basically pick up with Orcus as these guys are talking to each other, right? You've got Dr. Gregor, remember, she's kind of like the scientific person, the one that really seems to be the most hell bent on destroying the entirety of the mutant population. And then Director Devo, who's the one that's kind of running the whole thing. And the question Director Devo asks is, after 16 times that they've come here and tried to destroy us and Nimrod, what have we learned? That's something to know. The X-Men have tried this 16 times and they've done a variety of different things. They've they've brought in different teams. They launched a brood invasion. Right? Remember, broods are basically aliens from another dimension that deposit their eggs in and then those eggs essentially take over the host and then create more brood. And it doesn't matter, right? Nimrod still takes them all out. Every single time the X-Men launch an attack against Orcus, they get destroyed over and over and over again. And as they've analyzed this, the one thing that they've began to pick up on when the question's asked, again, what have we learned, is that Dr. Gregor hypothesizes that these are clones, that these are basically the same people who are being sent here, right? Because the bodies are being taken and you've got multiple versions of Wolverine. Now that's one thing to know, that Orcus and the rest of humanity don't know that the mutant population has the ability to resurrect themselves. They don't know that. They don't know about the five, the resurrection gardens, all that kind of stuff. They don't know about any of that kind of stuff, right? All they know is that seemingly these are clones or duplicates, doppelgangers, something like that. But somehow or another, the X-Men are able to duplicate themselves and they've just been sending teams here. The second thing they've learned is that the X-Men, the strikes that they're engaging in are basically the same, which reveals a huge revelation here that while Orcus is advancing, they're becoming more and more capable. They're quelling these X-Men threats faster and faster every single time they're launched. The X-Men threats always come in the same way, which means they don't remember when they were here before. And that's when the, the, the statements 
made by another person and suddenly saying, no, it's not entirely they don't remember, someone remembers. That's why they keep coming here. Somebody keeps sending them here. So what you end up doing is you switch over to Maura McTaggart, right? At the time that she creates basically the cure for the mutant race. And when this cure is created and she's basically thanking all the other scientists here, there's a colossal explosion, which is very, very similar to the one that we saw from Days of Future Past back in the day. Basically, everybody's killed except for Maura McTaggart, and she's met by the arrival of Mystique and Destiny. Now, this is a huge thing because this is actually the third life of Maura McTaggart. If you guys recall from House and Powers of X that Maura McTaggart has lived multiple lives. Now, the way that that was explained to us by Jonathan Hickman is that at most she has 11 lives and that she could just kind of continue living those lives basically forever and ever and ever and ever, right? She's like 11 in at the time that we go from House and Powers of X into the actual launching of Dawn of X, right? Everything that's happened over the course of the X-Men mythos so far has been the 11th life of Maura McTaggart. I'm pretty sure it's the 11th one. But so the question has to be asked here, how long can this go on for? If that's her mutant power, is to basically be resurrected and to always come back, but remember everything from her past life, then how can she, how can she possibly be destroyed? And that's one of the things that Destiny talks about. Now remember, Destiny's dead, right? So this obviously takes place before Destiny's death, but she's dead at the moment right now. So she's not really a threat that you have to worry about. But in this life that she has, when she's talking to Maura McTaggart, as she says, like, you would think there'd be no way to kill you. You would think there'd be no way to destroy you, but understand, I've seen your future. I know what can happen and I know how to destroy you. And so what you end up learning here is that the only way to kill Maura McTaggart and she stays dead forever is to kill her before her powers manifest. If you kill her one second after her powers develop, she'll reincarnate, right? Like a fraction of a second after her powers uh, emerge, she'll reincarnate. But if you kill her when she's like eight years old, she'll just be dead. She'll never be able to come back. But the question that Destiny has here is that in looking at Maura McTaggart, what she sees is that seemingly Maura McTaggart will always do this. Now, this is the other side of the equation that we never saw during House and Powers of X. For whatever reason that was never really given to us, Maura McTaggart had always worked on creating like a mutant cure. She'd had these different escapades happening over these different realities, but we didn't know why it is that she suddenly went from a person who was looking to cure the mutant population or looking to reduce the mutant population and not necessarily work against them as an enemy, but offer a way for mutants to become normal humans to suddenly being a person that's like, mutants have to survive. We didn't know the answer to that question, right? It just simply just happened that way, right? It's one of the things we even mentioned during House and Powers of X. And so what you get in this exchange between Destiny and Maura McTaggart is Destiny says, understand every time that you're reincarnated, I'm there, we are linked. Every time that you come back, you have memories of what happened in the life that you had before you die. And so something to understand here, I see your future, right? And every single time that you're reincarnated, I exist in whatever that life happens to be. And I know everything that happens. So I know everything that's going to happen to you. So I know whether or not, or I will know whether or not you will try to create a mutant cure, whether or not you will try to be some kind of a monster and destroy the mutant population. So she says, when she reveals to her, you can be killed as a little kid. It's kind of a threat, right? Sort of a sort of a threat that she says like we know how to destroy you we know how to make sure that you can never reincarnate you can never come back to life you can never enjoy this process of living out an infinite number of lives in an infinite number of ways just going on forever and ever and ever until the universe dies of heat death and so she says if you ever over the course of these lives that you live however many times that you die if you ever become the person that creates a formula that will find some way to destroy the mutant population if you ally yourselves with people who will destroy the mutant population if you do any Anything other than help us thrive, I will be there and we will kill you. And we will kill you however many times we need to. It doesn't matter. So she says, change, right? Become a person that helps the mutant population grow and thrive, especially because you and I both know that this, this existence of the mutant population will inevitably always lead to a war with machines or with man or a combination of both. Because she says, do you really believe that humanity will just let you have this formula, right? That you will have have this formula out there to cure the mutant population and humanity will say, okay, cool. Well, we'll just let the mutants that want to stay mutants, we'll let them kind of continue doing that. And those mutants who want to become human or want to lose their powers, we'll let them do that too. No, humanity will take that cure from you. They'll weaponize it and they'll use it to get rid of the mutant population. So she says, as long as you are out there as a person that's doing this, you are an existential threat to the mutant population's entire existence. And so when the question becomes, how do we ensure that you are that kind of person? How do we make sure that you 
know to never work against the mutant population lest you die in a horrifying way, the response that Mystique gives is, I think the answer is fear. And so Destiny says, perhaps, there's only one way to find out. And so what she does is she summons Pyro, right? Remember, Pyro is a mutant that has the ability to manipulate fire. He cannot create it, but he can control it. And she tells Pyro, kill Mora McTaggart, burn her, but do it slowly. So she never forgets what changing feels like, right? Make sure she suffers slowly and painfully. That was Mora's third life. Now it goes into Myra's 10th life, right? The current one that we're seemingly in right now. So I guess it's really this one as opposed to the 11th life. But the important thing here is that as we kind of continue on, we switch over to Mora's no place, right? Mora McTaggart. You switch over to the no place, the places she exists in, in Krakoa, where seemingly nobody can get to where she is, right? It's basically underwater, right? Where nobody would really know that it's there. Nobody would know how to access it. But when she arrives through her Krakoan gate, she's met by the arrival of Charles Xavier and Magneto. Now, here's a very, very important distinction and set of events that unfold here. That one of the things that was kind of given to us is that as the X-Men mythos exists right now by way of House and Powers of X, it's all predicated on the idea that at some point in the future, there will always be a war between the mutant population and seemingly everybody else. Either it'll be post-humans, right? So those individuals, those children of the vault that we've talked about before in the X-Men mythos, or it'll be humanity, Orcus, who have basically created Nemrod, who will wage war against the mutant population. And one way or another, it always leads to a massive conflict. And every single time, mutants are totally destroyed. And so it always seemed to be that this entire concept was basically an organization, a, a kind of agreement, and even a friendship that was struck between Charles Xavier, Moore McTaggart, and, and Magneto. What we're basically given here is this idea that there's trouble in paradise, man. One of the things that happens is that there's a statement that's made by Charles Xavier, right? Like, let's not reminisce on the past, right? It doesn't help anything or, or, or anything along those lines. And as the two of them are kind of talking, suddenly that dawns on Mora McTaggart. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Reminiscing about the past, like, what are you talking about? Like, like the two of you were here after I after I came back through my port. Did you know that I left? And that's when they reveal that what they had done is, is during the initial meeting of the Quiet Council, when they had fed her tea, they had secretly put nanobots in her body that had actually coalesced in her elbow that were developed by Forge so they could always know where she was. They don't really trust her, right? They don't really trust her at all. They kind of take her at her word because the threat that she presented seemed to be such a significant threat that they had to take it seriously, right? Because Charles Xavier read her mind and realized she was telling the truth. But the honest truth is that they never wholly believed her. The other part of this is that in the conversation that they have, the statement made by Maura McTaggart is, you have to destroy Nimrod and you have to destroy Destiny. Destiny can never be allowed to come back. Destiny can never be allowed to return. If she does, it would mean the end of everything. But given the context of the beginning of the story, that doesn't really seem to be the case at all. It seems like Maura McTaggart's lying, right? She's just saying that so that she can kind of live out her life the way she sees fit. And then in turn, never have to worry about destiny, which begs the question, if that's the case, if Maura McTaggart approached Charles Xavier and said, all these terrible things are gonna happen in the future, we gotta do something, you know, Bill Kirko and all that kind of stuff, is what she's doing actually setting the X-Men on, on a collision course with humanity and ensuring the mutant's destruction? That's the question that you have to ask because that's one of the things that Magneto and even, even Xavier himself talks about, right? They say like, okay, so here's the thing, right? Like regarding Nimrod and, and the robots and all that kind of stuff, every single time we launch an attack, that it basically has done nothing more than allowed humanity to create these things, right? So our actions have really put humanity on the path of creating Nimrod, right? But we did that at your behest because you said it was going to happen and we had to prevent it from happening. From there, it goes into the discussion of Mystique. And the idea is that with Destiny having been a love interest of Mystique, I mean, I guess it wasn't necessarily solidified, but it, it basically was, right? By all standards of measurement, Marvel told us that Mystique and Destiny have really had a love interest in each other for quite some time. That with Mystique being in a position of power, she will inevitably lead to the return of Destiny. And so in order to ensure that doesn't happen, Mystique has to be removed from a position of power. But arbitrarily getting rid of somebody who's part of the Quiet Council with seemingly no real motivation given is not an easy thing to do. Because while they are on the Quiet Council and while they were founders of the Quiet Council, the Quiet Council itself was founded under the notion of equality. That every member of the Quiet Council is equal to every other member, right? This is not George Orwell's Animal Farm where everybody's equal, but some are more equal than others. It's not like that, right? Or at least it's not supposed to be that way. But what they're basically really planning here and what, what uh, Moore McTaggart is telling them here is you need to find a way to get rid of Mystique, right? Sell it on a season of change, right? Say things 
things are changing around here. Everything kind of changes. We're celebrating, you know, the, the progression of our mutant population. And so what they do here, and this is actually a, a pretty shady situation, is the statement is made here by Maura McTaggart, right? She says, yes, Mystique has to be erased. She says, by now, everyone knows the process of how a mutant is returned from the dead. What is required is for you to seize the means of resurrection. The five, of course, cannot be controlled in any such manner. However, the mechanisms by which the process begins and ends can be. Control of the cradles is paramount. And she says, but more important than that is whose hands resurrection begins. I want you to collect what remains of Destiny's DNA. I want you to collect it and I want you to destroy it. Destroy every ounce of it. Destroy it all. Will you do that for the future of our nation? Will you do that for me? Literally, they're going to just destroy the existence of Destiny, right? Prevent her from, from ever coming into existence. This is pretty shady, right? This is a pretty shady thing for somebody like Charles Xavier or Magneto or anybody to be doing. And to a degree, it really seems to be predicated on the belief that what Moore McTaggart is doing is trying to ensure the future survival of the mutant population. And so in response to this, Charles Xavier says, as a show of good faith, a symbol of our realignment, we will. And then Moore McTaggart responds, don't lie about this. It's what keeps me up at night. It's the one thing I truly fear. And I haven't slept peacefully for a thousand years. I cannot, will not accept her breathing Krakoan air. I want her gone forever, burned from all existence. And so that's kind of a crazy thing here is because they're basically plotting to remove Mystique from power so Mystique can never advocate among the Quiet Council the return of Destiny. Because seemingly, Maura McTaggart's the only one that really has anything to fear from Destiny. And even if she passed on this notion to Xavier and to Magneto that the return of Destiny could lead to the destruction of the mutant population, nobody else in the Quiet Council would have any reason to believe this because they have no interaction with Maura McTaggart. And so if Mystique is able to create a compelling enough case and saying, no, having somebody who can see the future coming back can help us in ways that we can't possibly imagine because she will allow us to counteract threats before they ever become threats in the first place, right? To prepare for what was previously an unforeseeable future, then she's far more of a benefit than she is a liability that would sway the Quiet Council and ensure that Destiny is able to return. And so in order to initiate this whole thing, this whole process of removing Mystique from power, they start to kind of bring in, again, this whole idea of a season of change, that you have Cyclops basically stepping down from any real position he was in before and simply saying, I can offer myself as a captain, but I cannot be a commander among the Quiet Council anymore. That my job is to be a field member of the X-Men team. I just can't dedicate time to this anymore. And being a commander requires a lot of time and dedication. And so where Cyclops steps down, Bishop replaces him, right? Bishop ends up becoming a commander, which is, is a cool moment, right? Bishop was just a ridiculously cool character who never got his due. Let me tell you something, man. Under the right circumstances, Bishop is overpowered, man. This guy is so cool. I love the character of Bishop, but he ends up becoming the new commander. Following that, you switch over to the Quiet Council and them having their meeting, and that's when Xavier and Magneto go in for the kill. That's when they go into, yes, it's a season of change, everybody. It's a season of progress. We're evolving as we always do. We, as a mutant population, stand as the representative's evolution among the human race. And how can we possibly imbue this idea of evolution if we ourselves do not evolve. Therefore, we need to evolve the Quiet Council. We need to evolve this role the Quiet Council plays. And even Magneto goes as far as to say, if it's the will of the Council, even I would be willing to step down if it was required. Even I would be willing to accept this evolution and move to a lesser position. And so ultimately, the two of them turn their sights to Mystique. And Mystique's like, you know what? That's a great idea, guys. We've got an open seat on the Quiet Council, and I 100% agree it's a time for change, right? And so she says, I know a mutant we should consider for the council. And the response of Xavier is like, what? And then Magneto tries to cut her off and says, there'll be a time for that. But as a member of the quiet council, she can call a vote on anything anytime she wants to, so long as the rest of the council will let her. And she says, the time is now. The time for this, for, for the calling of this meeting is now. I offer a candidate for this council who sits in dominion of the mutant island of Krakoa. Come forth mutant. And that's when you get that line. That's when you get that phrase that was told to Mystique. There will be an island, not the first, but the last. This place will seem to be hope for our kind. When those days come, remember these words, bring me back. And if you cannot, if they will not, 
then burn the place to the ground. And that's when we end up learning the person summoned here to the quiet council by Mystique is none other than Destiny, fully resurrected. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.